Okay, well, we've talked about SN2 and SM1 mechanisms of substitutions, and obviously what we've got in the, have in these videos is not the whole ball of wax, right? But it's a, a good introduction and reminder of the way these things work. What I want to do in this um, clip is to talk about why one reaction chooses to proceed versus one mechanism versus the other. Some reactions undergo substitutions based on the SN2 only mechanism. Some reactions proceed based on the SN1 type reaction primarily. And some reactions mix. They mix between the two. And both mechanisms are occurring simultaneously as these substitutions are occurring. Now, what makes, um, you know, one versus the other predominate? Well, we're going to think of four different um, parameters that we've got to keep track of in order to make a decision about whether a reaction is going to undergo SN2, SN1, or something mixed. Okay, the first thing we're going to think about, which we've mentioned already, is the substrate. Okay? A substrate is typically our alkyl halide. The halide is going to be substituted for. Now, if our substrate is um, very bulky, um, which means it has lots of bulky, nasty groups, as other substituents on the outside, what that's going to do is it means that this alpha carbon is either secondary or tertiary. Right? A tertiary alpha carbon has lots of bulky carbons on the outside as substituents, and really that's going to promote an SN1 type of reaction. One reason why is because when this leaving group leaves, we can have stabilization of that carbocation intermediate with these other bulky groups. Okay? The other reason why that um, promotes an SN1 is because when these bulky groups are around, it makes it much more difficult for an incoming nucleophile to come attack this alpha carbon and pop it out in an SN2-based reaction. Okay. So the substrate you need to think about, is this alpha carbon primary, secondary, tertiary, or methyl? Okay. The less hindered it is, the more likely it's going to undergo an SN1 type of reaction, or an SN2 type reaction, because the incoming nucleophile can access this alpha carbon, and if it's less hindered, this you know, carbocation resulting from an SN1 mechanism is going to be very unstable. That's not going to happen. Okay. The other thing you got to think about in terms of the substrate is the leaving group. Is the leaving group a good leaving group or kind of a tough leaving group? You know, if there's a really great leaving group on here, it's going to promote maybe the SN1 reaction a little better because in order for the SN1 substitution to occur, this leaving group just has to leave. So it better be a good one. Most of our substrates are alkyl halides, so we don't have to think too much about the leaving group. Okay, the other condition we need to think about is this incoming nucleophile. Okay, if this nucleophile is a really great nucleophile, and we'll talk in lecture about what makes something a good nucleophile versus a bad nucleophile, you might imagine the more potent this negative charge is, the better it's going to be attracted to this positive alpha carbon. But the better the nucleophile is, you might imagine, is going to promote a SN2 reaction, right? We need a good nucleophile to knock this sucker out of there in an SN2 reaction, okay? Good nucleophile is going to promote an SN2-based reaction. With an SN1 reaction, remember, the leaving group leaves. We're left with a carbocation intermediate, and really any lousy nucleophile, even something like water, can wander around and, and quench this positive charge, okay? The third parameter we need to think about um, is the solvent conditions. Okay? The solvent conditions are really important in these substitution reactions really because they affect the stability of the nucleophile and potentially they affect the stability of a carbocation intermediate. Okay? If we want an SN2 reaction to occur, we kind of want this incoming nucleophile to be unstable. We want it to be very reactive. We want these, this negative charge on the nucleophile to be powerful and potent. Okay? Now, it turns out solvents that are polar and are protic can hydrogen bond with electrons on the nucleophile. And when they hydrogen bond, they sort of solvate it and stabilize it. So solvents such as water, 
and ethanol tend to stabilize nucleophiles, and that's bad if you want this nucleophile to react. So polar protic solvents tend to um, inhibit SN2 reactions, therefore promote SN1 reactions. Now, if you have a polar aprotic solvent, that tends to unmask these negative charges on your incoming nucleophile. Polar aprotic solvents um, are really good at promoting SN2-based reactions. And actually, there's a whole industry and a whole science made up of people trying to make really good solvents that are polar but don't have protons or hydrogens that can hydrogen bond in order to do their SN2 reactions in there. Um, and we'll see some of those in lecture. They have neat abbreviations. So we've looked at solvent, okay, polar, aprotic is good for SN2 reactions because it unmasks this nucleophile. We also have to think that polar solvents, polar protic solvents, one second hydrogen bond, can also stabilize this carbocation and, and promote the SN1 reaction. So when we think of solvents for SN2, polar aprotic, we want a unhindered alpha carbon so that we can attack with this nucleophile. And the leaving group, you know, on an SN1-based reaction has to be pretty good because it has to get out of here. We'll look at some examples of these and we'll try to figure out whether a reaction is going to go SN2, SN1, or it's going to be mixed. And we're going to be doing this in lab this week also.